Well, good morning. Actually, I guess I should say uh, good evening. It's actually about 5 o'clock by the time that I am recording this on a Thursday evening, and I'm doing that because, uh, well, I do have the coronavirus, and I am experiencing symptoms. And should these symptoms get worse, I don't think I'll feel much like preaching uh, in the next couple of days. So I figured we'd pre-record and uh, get it going. So today we're actually going to take a break from uh, finishing up on Colossians. Uh, we have one more sermon left in Colossians, uh, but I'm just going to take a break from that and wait till we get back together in person before we uh, finish out that series. So uh, I thought, man, what can we study uh, in the midst of, you know, our church just having a, you know, well, me having a... Uh, a run-in with the coronavirus, my family having a run-in with the coronavirus, which by the way, uh, right now, uh, my family is doing well. Uh, you know, we're struggling with a little bit of fever here and there, but uh, nothing too serious, and we just hope and pray that it continues that way. And looking forward to Tuesday when we have uh, the election and the election results and everything that that entails. Listen, I know that it is a uh, very uh, tumultuous time in our country, as we've seen all year, all year. And so I wanted to come out of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, uh, because I think it's timely, and I think it's a great opportunity. And the book of 1 Timothy is one of my favorite books. And so um, looking at uh, verses 1 through 7 here in chapter 2, uh, I think you'll agree with me that it fits our situation very, very well. So we're just going to exposit uh, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 7. So hopefully you've had a chance to turn there. I'm going to go ahead and read it. It says this, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul writes this letter to his son in the faith, Timothy. This is the first that we have of his letters to Timothy. Obviously, we have 2 Timothy as well. But in this letter, he is speaking to Timothy because Timothy is a young preacher. And he wants to encourage Timothy in the work that he left him in. Uh, Paul left Timothy in the town of Ephesus to continue their work there, uh, to continue helping that church move along. And so he's speaking to Timothy about some very real situations that are happening at the church at Ephesus while he's not able to be there. And so Paul, uh, here in this particular passage, uh, is telling Timothy, and he's, I'm going to start actually with verse 7, but as we go through, we're going to see that he's uh, telling Timothy to get people to pray for all people for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is for grand opportunities uh, to present the gospel. Uh, the second is for government to be a place and a, and a, a force for which uh, believers can count on to be able to share the gospel. And then he's also uh, presenting the gospel uh, itself uh, here in the midst of all of it as a basis for all the truth upon which we stand. So let's start with verse 7, because I think as we look at this whole thing, 7 really sets us up in the idea well so that we can continue forward. So verse 7, for this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. So Paul, uh, he, he alludes to his uh, position as a, uh, an apostle of Christ. And as he's talking about his position as an apostle of Christ, uh, he's utilizing that to talk about his authority. So when he's speaking to Timothy, he's saying, look, don't forget that when I'm telling you this, it comes from a place of authority. And I'm a teacher of Gentiles in the faith. You see, he's saying a lot of really radical things at the time. He's saying some things that, hey, look, this is un." comfortable for people to deal with and for people to hear. And specifically, he's a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. His apostleship to Gentiles is vital because we're going to see that Paul urges the believers to, for all people to be prayed for so that they may come to an understanding of the gospel, not just for the Jews, but for all people. 
So it's vital in this movement of the faith from a people group to all the nations. Now, when we talk about the nations, that's a very, very important thing because uh, as you've heard me say before, or if you haven't heard me say before, uh, a huge part of us fulfilling our divine mandate, the Great Commission, is making sure that every tribe, tongue, and nation has a representative around the throne of Jesus Christ in that final day when we will all uh, see him coming in his glory. Uh, Revelation talks about the fact that there will be people from every tribe, tongue, and nation uh, kneeling around the throne of Jesus Christ. And so if that is to be true, then that means that every people group needs to be reached for Christ. And there is still much work to be done in the reaching of these people. So, let's see what Paul says throughout this time about this. So, going back all the way to verse 1 in chapter 2. He says, first of all, meaning of prime importance. First of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving. So, those are just four words that detail the way that you pray for people. Uh, supplications, praying for their supply, praying for them through prayers. Intercession, that means going on their behalf before God. And thanksgivings, thanking God for those people. It says, for all people, to, for these prayers to be made for all people. Okay? And when he's praying for all people, he's commanded, or he's commanding that we pray for everyone. Not just the people that we know, but also the people that we don't know. So, have you ever thought about that, Christian? You know, sometimes we, uh, we, if we're doing well, we remember to pray for the people that are in our lives. Uh, sometimes we don't do so well and we don't even pray for the people in our lives. We just remember to pray for ourselves. Uh, what Paul is saying here is, look, pray for everyone. And this is convicting to me because I fit in that category I just mentioned. It's easy for me to pray for myself, to pray for my wife, to pray for my family, to pray for my little girl. It's easy for me to pray for those things. What's difficult is remembering consistently to pray all the time for all people, uh, to pray for uh, our body of believers. I, this, is, this is, if you know me, you know that <laughs> discipline is one of the things that I work on constantly. And what I have to do, and this may be of help to you, is I take my phone and I put reminders there in my phone so that uh, I can be reminded of the need to pray for people. Um, and so I, I do that as a way that helps me uh, uh, be able to share or, or, or helps me to be able to remember to pray for people in my life and for people who need the gospel. And so while I intercede uh, for people that I know, I also have to remember to intercede for the lost and the devastated. People around the world who do not know Jesus Christ. People whose names I have no idea maybe how to even pronounce. I need to be praying for all people. And he states this, again, as a matter of first priority. He says, not only should we pray for all people, though, watch what he says, too. He says in verse 2, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So we should pray for our kings and those in high places. Now, obviously, we don't have a king uh, but we do have a president, and we have a government, and we have representatives, and we have governors, and we have all kinds of people who are in high positions, government authorities uh, who have very real um, interactions with our lives through the policies that they put forth. And so he's saying to pray for all these people. Why? He says the reason is that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. Now, when I first read this uh, as a young believer, I was confused by it because I had read a bunch of books like uh, Radical by David Platt and, uh, and, and other books that uh, just reminded me of the, the need to be bold in my faith. And I thought, my goodness, why dignified and quiet? Why does it, what does that have to do with anything? Why, why should we be living quiet lives or dignified lives? Doesn't that, why does that matter? Um, and I was, I, it took me a while to understand that. But, uh, but one of the things that we have to understand is that for the gospel to be shared uh, with, with ease is a good thing. So when we live dignified and quiet and peaceful lives, that allows us opportunity to share the gospel without fear of persecution. That's what Paul's getting at. He's asking that 
the people be uh, that they be um, very very uh, intentional in their prayers for these things because of the simple fact that Paul wants them to be able to share their faith without fear or threat of persecution. And this would eventually come true as it is for us in, uh, in our time now. Uh, now we see a little bit of that going away, but uh, you know our persecution that we face is nowhere near the level of persecution that they faced back then. And this is a blessing from God. But be warned that this does not mean we should get to a point that we no longer have a missionary zeal. See, that's what I was afraid of whenever I first read this, is that Paul was saying, whoa, you shouldn't have a missionary zeal. Well, that's not true at all. Paul wants us to have that zeal for people to come to know the Lord. But sometimes when we come to this place of peace, quiet, dignified lives, we find ourselves a little too comfortable. And we find ourselves a little bit too uh, happy with where we are uh, and, and who we know that already knows the Lord. And I don't think that should be the case for believers. We should always be ready to give an account for uh, the faith that we have. And we should never uh, be satisfied with the amount of people who have come to know the Lord. There are still lost souls that face the very real threat of hell if we do not share our faith. And so what Paul wants us to have is the freedom to worship and the freedom uh, to go about expressing Christ throughout our lives. And the goal is the best of conditions in order to expand God's kingdom. All right, and so then we come to uh, verse 3. Paul says, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. He delights in the well-being of his people. Have you ever thought about that? God delights in your well-being. When you are doing well, God is delighting in that, and he is happy about that. So his ultimate end for us is that we have peace forever in heaven. Okay? Peace forever in heaven. And so, too, he does want us to have a taste of that here on this earth. Now, we have to contrast that, though, with the martyrdom that many, many faced. You know, the apostles did not live quiet and easy lives. They faced death. But the point was, was that they had an ultimate peace, even if the world didn't give them that ultimate peace, because their ultimate peace came from the Lord and not from anything that they had here on this earth. And that should be true for us, too. We can experience blessings here on this earth. We can experience all kinds of great things. But we have to remember and have to understand that everything that happens here is only a shadow of what's to come in heaven. And then uh, verse 4, He desires, God our Savior, desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, this is a big statement here. God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, there's three particular atonement theories that I'm going to look at here as we go through this verse. So when Paul says that he, that God desires all people to be saved, what does that mean? Does that mean that all people will be saved? That would be the, uh, that would be the, uh, the, the statement of what's called universalist atonement. And in universal atonement, uh, what they say is that all will be saved because God desires it. And this would be one of their proof texts for that. They would go to this and they would say, look, all people will be saved. Hell is not real. Hell is not something we have to worry about. All people will be saved uh, in, in, in the end. And so the atonement then would cover all people regardless of their sin, their religion, their faith, their background. Anything along those lines. That's what the universalist atonement would say. I disagree, okay? Uh, I don't think that that is the case because should that happen, what would be the point of Christ dying for us? If there were multiple ways to reach heaven, then why would Christ have to come and die for us? He who lived a perfect life because we couldn't live perfect lives, because we couldn't reach God's standard, why would God have to send his son to die for us if there was another way to heaven. It just doesn't make sense. There's other reasons, too, that I won't get into right now. The next one is particular or limited atonement. Now, this one claims that while God desires all to be saved, he also desires that only the elect be saved. Now, one is an ideal will, and one is a will that actually comes into fruition. 
And so while God desires that all be saved, this is not the reality that he has sovereignly chosen to create. Now we have some uh, who believe that, uh, in, in, especially in the SBC. Uh, this is what would be probably more a reformed traditional understanding of, of atonement. And so uh, we have Calvinist brothers and sisters uh, who believe that. Uh, it's not to say that um, it's not to say that there's some deterministic or fatalistic uh, understanding to that, but that is a reality, and I think one that you can make from Scripture. However, that is not the one that I ascribe to. The one that I ascribe to is unlimited atonement, uh, and I hope that I that I, that I uh, stated the limited atonement theory well, um, because again, I you know I kind of I, I kind of play a middle ground. I believe that uh, people of both sides of the atonement argument uh, can fellowship together in the same church. That's very, very important to me. So what I describe, though, is going to be unlimited atonement. That's kind of where I fall. And that claims that God desires truly that all be saved. Therefore, the atonement is available to all. However, the atonement is only effective for those who respond to God's gospel and grace. And so the idea there is that God says, hey, here's the atonement. It's available for all, for anyone who would uh, surrender to Christ as Lord and trust Him as Savior. Um, but it's only effective for those who respond in such a way. Now, uh, we can get caught up in the differences between unlimited atonement and limited atonement, but I don't think that's the point of this verse. The point isn't to create arguments about what God really, really means behind this. The point, the emphasis, is that God wants all nations to have access to the gospel. And universalist atonement, listen, that's heretical. But if we have differences between limited atonement and unlimited atonement, but we're still seeking to make the gospel go to all nations, listen, that's okay. That's a secondary issue. It doesn't have to be something that divides the church body. Uh, but what we should all come together and say is that all nations need to know the good news of Jesus Christ because God desires that all people be saved. And so if God desires that all people be saved, then who are we to keep the gospel from anybody? And then verse 5 uh, says this, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, this verse, it hints at the divinity of Jesus and the manhood of Jesus. We have to remember that Jesus Christ was both man and God. You can't have one or the other. To do only one or only the other is to limit Christ in who he really was, because he was fully man and fully God. And so that is why he is the perfect mediator, because he lived that perfect life as a man and bridged the gap because he was fully God. And so that bridges us between us, man, and him, God, together. And that's what Christ did. And there are times in Scripture where Christ's manhood is emphasized and times in which his divinity is emphasized, and neither is wrong. We have to refer to Christ as a man. We have to refer to Christ as God. But it's not proper to act as though one of those natures is non-existent. Now, Christ as the sole mediator, points to the fact that prayer for salvation of all people is not optional. It's not optional. You see, if somebody does not have access to the gospel, then they don't have access to Jesus Christ. You know, there's this thought that goes around that, oh, if somebody hasn't heard the gospel, you know, God will make another way. Listen, I don't see that in Scripture. It, it doesn't show up in the Bible. And if I'm going to trust the Bible then what that means is that I need to get serious about sharing the gospel regardless of the people group. That means I want all people to have access to the gospel. That means I need to go on, there's a website that you can go to called the Joshua Project. And you can go on the Joshua Project and you need to see what the reached factor is of each people group. What the Joshua Project does is it has all the unreached people groups in the world listed so that you can pray for them. And it has the percentage of people that have trusted Christ. And, if, and, and some of them have 0% of, 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 of trusting in Christ. No, nobody who has trusted the gospel from their people group. And so we need to be praying for these peoples to come to know 
Jesus. And the command to pray points to the intrinsic nature for which the church exists. See, we are not to simply exist or to be comfortable or to just be happy until Jesus comes back. That is not our directive in life. Our directive in life is to make His glory known among the nations. And if we don't make His glory known, then we are not fulfilling our purpose. And we are not doing the things that Christ tasked us with before He left this earth. That means that we are failing in our commission. Oh, let it not be said of us that we did not get serious about taking the gospel to all people. And then it says in verse 6 that Jesus Christ gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the proper testimony, which is the testimony given at the proper time. The gospel is preached here that Jesus Christ would give himself as a ransom for all people. All people. And Paul makes an example of proper teaching through his constant use of the gospel to back up his claims and testimonies and teaching. And again, proper teaching stems from the gospel. Now, you see this part where it says the testimony uh, that is given at the proper time. It's interesting. You look in Paul and in many places you see this idea of proper time. Uh, Galatians 3 is, uh, is one particular place uh, in which we see uh, Paul talking about that proper time or this fullness of time. That means that there was this great big cosmic moment in which Jesus Christ burst onto the scene. And when humanity was ready for Jesus, that's when he came. And when all the future that was to happen, all the things that were yet to happen, all of that would hinge upon Christ coming. And so this testimony that's given at the proper time shows that Jesus Christ was sent to the world perfectly. Now, what do we need to do from this message? We need to be committing to a few things. We need to be committing to prayer for all people. Are you serious about praying for people to come to know the Lord Jesus? Whether that's people in your life, whether that's tribes in Africa, whether that's different opportunities that present themselves, are you praying for more and more people to come to know Jesus Christ? What about And the next question is, are you taking those opportunities to share with people in your life? To talk about the goodness of God to them? To share that, yes, Jesus Christ is my Lord, and He is my Savior, and He can be your Savior too. And listen, if Jesus Christ isn't your Savior, and you're watching this today, listen, there are things that all of us have done, all of us have sinned, we've all messed up. But there is no way to get around that sin but through Jesus Christ Himself who paid the penalty for your sin. And if the penalty for your sin is not paid, then you stand on the opposite side of God's judgment. <coughs> And God does not want you to face His judgment. He desires that you be saved. So will you be saved? That's my prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for just giving us the opportunity to worship today. God, I pray that as we share this time, to, as we have shared this time together, uh, digitally, of course, and uh, Father, through the internet, uh, God, I pray that uh, we would just seek to bless you and to honor you. Lord Jesus, if there are any here uh, that are listening that don't know you, my prayer is that they would come to know you right now. Father, would they pray this prayer? Lord Jesus, I submit to you. I am a sinner. I have messed up. I have broken your holy statutes. Jesus, would you save me from my sin? Would you save me from the punishment of hell? Would you show me God's love for me? Holy Spirit, would you come and dwell me right now? Lord, I repent and I follow you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer with me just a second ago, what I want you to do is I want you to text me. Uh, text me at 903-217-3318. And please let me know that uh, you came to know the Lord today. 
Uh, I would love nothing more than for us as Castle Baptist Church to be able to walk with you in your discipleship journey. Hey, love you guys. Uh, keep praying for all of us. The prayer is that nothing spread on Sunday and, uh, and that all things uh, would just continue to go better and better and, uh, and that we would get this coronavirus out of the way and that we can continue going back to church and doing all the things that we uh, know and love to do. All right. Thank you, guys. God bless you.